Thank you. That's perfect. Welcome to Grace Fellowship of Georgetown. We're glad that you have joined us tonight, just enjoying the presence of God, which is what this is really all about, just about spending time with Jesus. And when you spend time with Him, you want to please Him. You want to fulfill His assignment for your life. And uh, He's coming back for a bride, a glorious bride, that is all in. That's all He has. In fact, they'll say words I've said many times to God. God, whatever you want to do with my life, you do it. Not my will, but yours be done. What are you got to shift, change, change directions? Uh, if it's in your will, if, if it's to fulfill your plan, I want to do it. Because I want to get to heaven and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. And we've been talking about uh, some processes are necessary, I believe, to go to the glory of God. I mean, if we're to, go, to be the glorious bride, we've got to move into the glory of God. And I think there's things that we have to do to position ourselves properly. It says in Revelation 19, the bride, the, the wife of the lamb, has made herself ready. Amen. So it's not that we just get saved to do what we want to. Well, we believe in Jesus. And so we get saved. We develop a love relationship with God. Find out His plan for us and through His direction, assistance, anointing, provision, we fulfill that plan. Amen. And I might say the plan is always greater than you can do of yourself. Why? Because God wants you to need Him to partner with Him to do it. Amen. It's going to demand of you things that you believe you can't do of yourself. But you'll take your faith and you'll grab a hold of it and move into it. Amen. And the faith walk is the most exciting walk on earth. To trust God for a call on your life and to trust Him every step of the way. And I'm telling you, if you do it, it's an adventure. Amen. It's been now over 35 years ago. In fact, I believe it was 1987. I was sitting in my recliner at home, and I was just reading the Word, and I came to Ezekiel chapter 47 about a river of God flowing out from under the temple of God. And the further they got from the temple, the deeper the waters got. And God showed me that was the passage of time. And this is the water got so deep, it was waters you had to swim in. Amen. And wherever the water went, it brought healing and restoration. And God spoke to me. And he says, I'm bringing this river in the end times. I mean, it was one of those times I'm sitting with God. And he said, if you will trust me with your whole life, I'm going to let you pioneer the river of God in the end times. Amen. And it basically will be the most exciting thing you could ever imagine. I said, do it, God. Amen. In fact, he told me, I put the pioneering attitude within you when you were young. And... Uh, here we are. Now, it may look like we haven't explored a whole lot, but, but we have. We explored the river of the Word of God. And we're learning what it takes to step into the glory of God. And again, we're finding things aren't automatic. It's not that God's just going to wave His hand and everything happens all of a sudden. It's that we've positioned ourselves. Jesus, when He was uh, raised from the dead, appeared, it says... To over 500 people. But on the day of Pentecost, only 120 have positioned themselves. Do you follow me? Now think about this. He administered to thousands and tens of thousands when he was on earth. You follow me? Multitudes left him in John 6 when he said, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And by the time he's raised from the dead, only 500 people are coming around. And only 120 stay where he told them to stay to receive the power from on high. He says, if you stay here, don't go. I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. you receive power to be a witness all through the earth. And 120 were left. I like to believe, not out of pride, I just hope I would have been one of the 120. How about you? I want to be hungry enough for God to position myself for whatever he wants to bring. 
And uh, it's true today. God's saying, I've got instructions for you to move into my glory. If we knew it all already, we'd be there. But like Israel was told to conquer the promised land, they could only take a piece at a time. They took a city at a time. And God said, I'm not going to give you the whole land all at once because you're not able to fill it, to possess it. If I gave you the whole land and drove out all the inhabitants all at once, wild beasts will come in and destroy all the harvest. So I'll only give it to you as you can possess it. And God's given us revelation of how to move into the glory only to the level we can apply it. Did you follow me? And I want to go into a teaching. We've been on it for a few weeks now about some steps I believe that are necessary to move into the glory. Now, we started with uh, 2 Corinthians. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians, just to, just to again, set the groundwork. Chapter 10. Let's start reading at number, verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It's not a flesh battle, right? For though we walk in the flesh, we don't warfare the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, God's got supernatural weaponry for us. And he says it will help you to pull down strongholds. Now, 30-something years ago, we were really getting involved in a spiritual warfare movement. And we're trying to pull down strongholds over the cities and Bind strong men over the land and everything else. And devils were laughing at us. They were saying, you can't pull down strongholds over the city until you remove the strongholds from your thinking. Amen. And so strongholds were areas of your thinking that oppose the word of God. Because he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity... Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now stop right there a minute. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I believe to the obedience of Christ, Christ means to the Word. Jesus was the Word made flesh. And so if we want to move into the glory, if we want to be effective at spiritual warfare, if we want to take care of the strongholds, which unless you bind the strong man... You're not going to possess anything. We've got to learn to take thoughts captive. Which to me should be part of Christianity 101 training when you get saved. I mentioned this last week. But it's not. I'm just curious. How many people in here, before you came in here, and say the denominational churches you were in, how many ever heard it taught that you should take every thought captive? I'm looking for hands. And all of the multitudes in here tonight, I don't see a single hand. We weren't taught that. They didn't teach me that back in the religious you know, arena. We were just trying to survive. We were just holding on to God's unfaithful hand trying to survive until the rapture came. But here Paul says clearly, you've got to be able to take every thought captive. We went to Philippians 4.8 where he says, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, just, honest, pure, love, of good report? If there be any virtue, be any praise, think on these things. God's thought filters. What should be part of basic Christianity training is you've got to learn to analyze what you're thinking and cast down what does not align with the Word of God. Think about your mind as a giant mixing bowl. You're going to get to eat what comes out of that bowl. You follow me? And so God's got great things he wants to put in the bowl. I mean, there's taters and onions and 
pork chops and fried chicken and, you know, all the other things. Ale eights, all that good stuff in the bowl. And the devil's going around picking up horse, uh, uh, I forgot what you call them, biscuits. He's throwing them in the bowl. And every other kind of biscuit, every other kind of lie. I don't care how much you throw in more taters, horse biscuits mess up the result. Amen. Reminds me of that old joke about the Boy Scouts, but we're not going to go into it tonight. You want your mind to only allow in it pure ingredients. And it requires learning to monitor what you're thinking. We discuss there's a part of your soul that has the ability to analyze what are you thinking. I know we're doing a lot of review, but I'm trying to really bring this forward. A part of your soul can re review and analyze what are you thinking right now. Amen. And you have a decision to, to filter every single thing that comes into your mind. Is this thought of God? How do you know if it's of God? Well, I just felt the peace of God when I heard it. No, does it align with the Word of God? Does what you're hearing align with the Word? If it doesn't, cast it out. Amen. Pull the horse biscuits out of the batter and re just refuse for it to get in there. I was uh, talking to my sister one time about, she's read a lot of the stories because we have a Kansas background. A lot of the stories about them, the wagon trains moving west. And it talked about when they left the east, they were so careful to make sure when they're making their bread, they washed their hands and all the stuff and got clean and kneaded their dough. And by the time they got further out west, <laughs> they'd be picking up buffalo chips to make the fire and going straight to the kneading trough. I don't want that. I appreciate my food being protected by health food codes, right? So, <laughs> I know that was an unnecessary sidetrack. A little hist history there. But we have the responsibility to guard what's going into the batter. I mean, I've seen videos of people that are cooking, and they got all these animals in the house. Cats on the counters, dogs all over the place. And while their back's turned, the, dog, the, the, the cat's licking out of the batter bowl or whatever's happening. Anybody seen any of these? I don't want that pie. Had they stayed alert and watched over their bowl, even if there were cats around, they could have kept the cat out of the bowl. Amen. And I'm telling, cats are trying to get into your bowl into your mind. CAT is an acronym that represents the attempts of the enemy to take you down. I want to give you three letters. Spell CAT. C-A-T. C, the devil comes to condemn. A, he comes to accuse. And T, he comes to tempt. Condemn, accuse, and tempt. Imagine those are thoughts that are bombarding your mind. That you can either receive that into your batter, cat licking out of your bowl, or even other things, right? Or you can say, I shut that down. That's not from God. I refuse to meditate that. You take the word of God, the sword of the spirit against it, and you circumcise that thinking out of your mind. You just cut it away. Amen. Which determines whether your mind is fit for God's use fully or not. And the devil wants to make your mind his playground. We have responsibility. And again, I think this should be part of basic Christian teaching. The responsibility to guard what you think. Because as long as your mind is open to his operations, you can talk holy, holy, holy all you want. 
but uh, there's cat litter in your head. And all those bombardments of the enemy, all the accusations, all the condemnation, all the temptation will damage your faith. Condemnation, it's hard to believe God for anything when you're condemned. Do you follow me? Why? Because you don't feel worthy to receive. Well, you know, you didn't even go to church last week at all. You know, you know, uh, God told you to give that away and you didn't or you fell asleep in prayer or, you know, you said the wrong thing to that person, whatever it might be. I mean, as perfect as we try to live, the devil will find something to condemn you over. Amen. And you can either meditate that or you can cast it down. And if you meditate it, because he's sitting, he does it subtly. He makes it think you, it's you thinking. He's sitting there telling you, you know, you don't, God is not going to answer your prayer. Who do you think you are? You've let him down again. You know, you said you love God, but your actions prove differently. And then, and then, and then. So when you go to say, God, I believe I've received, in the back of your mind is you're unworthy. Condemnation neutralizes your faith. Accusations do the same thing. Amen. And, you know, so much better to, to be trying to charge ahead doing something for God than battle temptation. Amen. We've got to get to the place we're not tempted by anything the enemy would try to do. So a cat's wanting to lick out of the batter bowl of our thinking. And you've got the responsibility to guard what goes in. Now at home... We have a big batter mixing bowl that Patty has. And she's got a matching plastic lid. Do you follow me? And so let's say, you know, our puppies can't get on the counter. Uh, but let's say there was a cat or something visiting, which has happened. She can say, okay, I put in the ingredients I want in it, and she could put the lid on it. Snap the lid shut, go do other things, and come back to it to start again. Right? And while the lid's on there, nothing could enter it that she didn't want in it. But there's a problem. You can't put a lid on your thinking. Your mind is always working. Even when you're asleep, your mind is functioning. Amen? You can't just shut your mind off. I mean, you can try. You can go fishing. Watch Andy Griffith, I guess. The kerosene cucumbers we talked about. But you really can't shut down your mind with the enemy putting stuff into it. The only thing you can do is say, no, I block that. I reject that. I cast it down. Not my thought. Here's what the word says. And in doing so, you prevent the enemy from creating more strongholds. You uh, uh, keep him from defiling your thinking, causing you to speak the wrong things. And it enables you to think only in alignment with the Word of God. But again, it's not an instant thing to do. It takes time and it takes much practice. I'm trying to think of the right example. Uh, I guess I could use unicycle riding. I somewhat remember learning to ride a unicycle. I was a teenager. And uh, my brother had a unicycle he'd gotten. And we were all learning to ride it. And he was phenomenal on it. He could ride off the back of a truck with a young kid on his shoulders, hit the ground and keep going. Up and down curves, spin around. He was amazing on it. Uh, I could ride it. But I remember starting off, I had to hold on to something. You know, start pedaling, probably made it a half a turn. Boom, fell off. Probably did it, I don't know how many times. I would venture to say, I'm sure I did at least 50 times falling off. Till finally, I could go a ways. 
then I could go a ways further. Then I could go a long ways. Uh, I remember we used to have the picnics out at Henson's Farm, and I'd ride through the field all the way down this path to the to the shelter, bumps and everything else. No, no problem. Why could I do that? I had practiced. Amen. And I haven't ridden one in probably 20 years. When I tried two weeks ago, I still rode it again. Yes, I rode it with probably 60, 80 more pounds than I did last time. So the landing didn't go quite right. Uh, and, of course, it was, I was rusty as well. The point being I'm trying to make out of this is to learn to take your thoughts captive and cast them down. You will fail and fail and fail, but then you get better at it. Then you'll fail and fail, and you'll get a little better at it. It's like a cyclical development that you're learning to guard what goes into your mixing bowl. And listen, the neat thing is, is when you realize enemies put a bunch of stuff in there, you can repent, cast it down, and say, get out of my head. So speaking the word in that place to heal it. You follow me? To drive out those thoughts. But what you don't want to do is let those seeds set long enough they start to take root. In the, in the parable of the sower, it tells us that the word, I'm sorry, the seed is the word of God. But to any, any words are seeds. The word of God is the good seed. If you remember the parable of the wheat and the tares, there was wheat sown in the field, but the enemy came and sowed tares. Seeds, weed seeds. And the weed seeds were choking out the good seeds. In fact, even in the parable of the sower, the thorns came up, choked out the word that became unfruitful. The enemy is in a thought battle with your mind. Will you think about the things of the kingdom or the things of darkness? Now, there's neutral thoughts. Basketball's a neutral thought. Just some level. And if you're praying the best player on the other team gets hurt, that's probably not a good idea. Not a neutral thought anymore. Not a neutral thought anymore. But, oh, you've done it. Quit looking ahead like that. Maybe he just misses this game. As you can have neutral thoughts. You can think about making cornbread. You can think about the ball game. You can think about, you know, driving someplace, happy thoughts. But in the midst of that, the enemy is always trying to sow something in himself. There's familiar spirits trying to convince you that you're a failure, that nobody likes you, that uh, you'd be better off alone. Why go to church? It doesn't work. Spirits are always trying to impart these thoughts in the midst of your day. Meditations. Does anybody know what I'm speaking about? And if you don't do something about it, those will take root. And then when you come to church, you feel like nobody shook my hand. Nobody likes me. They like them better. Or, you know, I don't think I need to go to church. I can just watch online at home. I'm good doing that. And, you know, God loves me no matter what I do. Ridiculous thoughts. In fact, a lot of the silly doctrines we have today is because somebody didn't cast something down. Amen. And it took root. So here's the thing. You've got the responsibility to take captive every thought to the Word of God. Amen. But there's a problem. There's a catch. You can't take thoughts captive to the Word for a word you don't know. If you don't know the Word, you can't take them captive. How many people come into this church or into other churches and tell us how they think church should be run? Well, I just think God wouldn't do that. You know, when I get on the topic of homosexuality, I just believe God loves everybody. Well, I mean, that's a fine thought. I think He does too. But He can't bless everybody. There are certain things that get in the way of the blessing. That's one of them. Right? 
But people operating out of the natural mind had this mindset of what the love of God should look like. Well, he wouldn't hate anybody. He would love everybody. Well, does he love the serial killer? He loves the serial killer as much as he loves you. But chances are a serial killer is probably going to hell. I know some can get born again. You follow me? But there are things we do that get in the way. And the natural-minded Christian, not the spiritual mind, but the natural-minded has their own concept of what they think God would do, how he would move. And they won't cast down thoughts that are out of alignment with God's will in that area. You follow me? Well, speaking in tongues is of the devil. So they come to church and speak in tongues. Well, I can't stay here. Well, they've, they've had a seed develop, become a stronghold, and they reject that word. So part of our assignment in taking every thought captive is to get into the Word. And we've got our chart up here. And we've called this our mind. Find my fancy button here. Here's our mind. And the enemy is through lies he imparts into our mind. Negative emotions has built strongholds. Areas of thinking that, that doesn't align with the Word of God. Here's an example of a stronghold we've all fought. You let God down. You've fallen short of the glory. Amen. God can't bless you right now. Has anybody heard that one before? I have. Repeatedly. Probably in the last week. Look at you on crutches. Amen. Well, I can praise God on crutches too. On the other side, we've got God trying to bring to us the Word uh, fueled by the Spirit of God to create Word-dominated thinking in you. And to advance this line that it fills all of your mind requires, you go to war with the devil in your thoughts. And everywhere he tries to tell you a lie, you cast it down and you build new fortifications of the word that you take new ground. Did you follow me? How many people's faith level right now is it a place you believe for more of the promises of God now than you did a year ago? Two years ago, five years ago. I'm always seeing new things to advance my faith into. You know, we moved into this mall uh, 16 years ago, going on 17. And I told the mall manager when I moved in, I said, what would it take for me to buy the whole mall? Amen. And she chuckled. Well, it just sold for $1.4 million. Okay. Uh, I didn't have that much, and my faith wasn't at the level to believe for that much. I don't know what it's valued at now, but I no longer care. I believe we can believe for them all now. Am I doing it actively? No, because I don't know the will of God in it yet. But I am believing no matter what happens, we have favor with God. Amen. Amen. And I'm declaring God, if this is our mall, show us what to do to bring it into our possession. What, or any other building around town, whatever it happens. God's got property for us, our property that they can't move us out of. Amen. My faith is at a higher level than it was 16 years ago. It's a higher level now than it was a year ago. Especially praying for people for pain, deliverance. Every year the anointing increases. Every year the re revelation of our authority in Him increases. And every year, our faith goes to a higher level. We go from faith to faith and glory to glory. But guess what? I know more word now than I did a year ago. In other words, I mean, I've read the Bible over and over again, but there's more solidified within me. Especially now, I'm almost done going through the whole Bible, searching out the, the principles of, of the kingdom. I'm up to Habakkuk right now, Habakkuk chapter 2. And I've only got a short time left to go through the entire Bible 
listing out what I believed are all the, the principles of the kingdom. Well, that does something to you. Do you follow me? And so we as word people are saying, okay, God, I'm going to build within me revelation of your word to such a level the enemy can't penetrate anything. It builds a wall around your life the enemy can't uh, 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 infiltrate. In fact, the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 4, we should claim all the promises of God to enter into his rest. Because anywhere we don't have the promises operational, we've not built our faith in the promises, becomes an area of the wall the enemy can slip through. But again, this should be part of basic Christian teaching, beginning how to take thoughts captive, and it's not. And I'm of the belief we don't go to the glory without practicing this. Will we have it down perfectly? No. See, again, let me, let me talk about a progression. 35 years ago, I didn't take any thoughts captive. Do you follow me? I mean, maybe here and there's something I don't want to think about. Or, no, I'm not thinking about that. But I didn't know anything about taking thoughts captive. I've been saved for five years, but I didn't know that. And probably wouldn't learn it for another five or ten years. Oh, we learned to cast some things down. You know, we learned to cast down thoughts of sickness. We thought, oh, I'm thinking about sickness. Cast it down. I'm thinking about lack. No, I cast it down. But it's only been in the past probably 15 years I've really endeavored to take every thought captive to study what am I thinking and reject what doesn't align with the word. And starting out, it was like the unicycle. I fell a lot. But the further I'm into it, the better at it I am. And I don't believe there's a whole lot of time I'm thinking failure. I'm thinking lack. I'm thinking what if scenarios about the devil winning. Because you, it becomes like wax on, wax off. You know what I'm talking about, right? The karate kid, he's polishing the cars, wax on, wax off. and He thinks it's for nothing. It's not producing. Till Mr. Miyagi tries to punch him and all these reactions jump up. And you get to practicing analyzing what's in your mind. It's all also becomes there becomes a, a triggers to capture things. Who was I talking here recently about Halon systems? Is that anybody in here tonight? When I worked for a, uh, IBM, we had several areas of the plant where they're working with explosive gases. You know, they're trying to make new typewriter ribbons, which have a lot of alcohol and such in them. And, I mean, you could go into some rooms, you'd smell the fumes. And so a spark could be very dangerous. So on the wall, they had these big steel balls full of a gas called halon. And in the room, pointing all through the room, were these photo eyes that were, that were designed to recognize spark any time of fl any type of flame starting and if they saw the spark they'd set off the halon and you could breathe in halon but it'd be it'd be like an explosion boom and the room's filled with halon and nothing could burn in the halon and what happened is if you went in there and they'd, do, they'd come in, the fire people come in and do demonstrations for us. Has anybody seen this before? they do demonstrations and they'd light a match. And before that light, the flame could even start to get up. Boom, the thing would go off. And it would shut down the risk of explosion. Do you follow me? And you can get to the place, I believe, in your monitoring your thoughts. You have a halo system in place it's armed it's loaded it's ready to go i mean it's on a hair trigger you get to the place all of a sudden there's a thought of sickness hitting you pow you shut that down 
Lack, pow. Failure, pow. Defeat, pow. It's like you don't have to sit there and think, what am I thinking right now? What am I thinking right now? What am I thinking right now? You just get to the place there's enough word in you. I mean, I've seen this happen. You can't, you can't even function because you're so worried about you're going to make a mistake. But you get to the place you know enough word that you're, it's self-monitoring. If I can put it that way. And when you recognize that, now the self-monitoring, uh, you, it alerts you. What are you thinking? You recognize, that ain't God. Boom, you explode on that thing. And I explode on things all the time. I mean all the time. And probably some of you do too. Because if a thought hits me of I'm getting sick, I'm exploding on that thing. How do you explode? By stripes, I'm healed. You just jump at it. You don't play with you, jump at it. And Patty tells you hear me all the time. I cast that down. Not my thought. Is that right? Sometimes quite under number other times. Shut up, devil. And you quote the word. I have a thought in my mind if I could if I could just get that one out. Patty loves our swimming pool. We have an above ground swimming pool. The uh, first one was given to us in 2003, and I put it up, and I never realized how much she loved a swimming pool. I'd have pulled one up 20 years before if I'd have known. And, uh, well, we didn't have a house then, 19 years before. She just lives in that pool during the summer. And, but she's got, a, she's, got a, she's got a process she does. She's got to debug the pool first. Now, I'm not talking about there's all these bugs swimming around. I'm talking about there's, this is a 27-foot round pool, four and a half foot deep. If there's a dead bug on the bottom, I'm talking about a little one. She can't swim until it's gone. It's a dead bug. She might accidentally stir it up and touch it. So she has her little dip neck. In fact, I got her a vacuum. I got her a bug vac for the pool, underwater vac. And uh, she puts on her mask. She goes under, and it'll take her an hour going through the pool, searching out. That's half her swim routine. Zzz, zzz, zzz. Swim around until she's convinced all the bugs are gone. Empty the strainer. Don't want any bug juice circulating around and touching her. She is absolutely, how can I say it, vigilant in bug monitoring the pool. And we need to be like that with the thoughts of the devil. It's a battle. We're in a war. Amen. And what military leader lets the enemy just march in and set up fortifications wherever he wants to? Well, I'm sorry. I forgot about the current president. There are exclusions. Anyway, what military leader wanting to lead their country the right direction? Let's the enemy just come and do what he wants to. Oh, you need arms? Here's a whole bunch. Let me turn over, you know, all these modern advanced weaponry. No sensible general does that. Amen. And no sensible Christian lets the devil do what he wants to in their mind. You explode on those things. And you get, you get where it's a challenge. Like with Patty, she could get in the pool just to debug it. <laughs> Would you swim? Well, I just debugged today. And she'll debug against the next day in case, case any got in before, you know, between the two days. And you learn to deep, you know, you, there's a thing called debugging computer software, Right? You get all the potential glitches out of the way. In the same way, you debug your thinking. You get those enemy thoughts out of your mind. You refuse for him to set up camp again. 
But it requires, again, monitoring. It requires effort. It requires practice. You're going to fall down. But you know what? If I removed half the thoughts of the enemy he was trying to sow, it's better than letting him sow all of them. And the more you do it, the easier and more instantaneous it becomes. The more it becomes part of you. You know, in here, we understand the power of our words. And for those in covenant, you know, we know uh, if we hear something saying the wrong thing, saying something inappropriately, depending on our covenant, we may try to correct it. Amen. Be careful with that. First, pull the, pull the log out of your own eye, right? Well, I'm sick and tired of that. Oh, we don't say that. But you learn to monitor what's coming out of your mouth. But it came out of your mouth because it was first in your head. Amen. And we've got to get good at digging up those mines. Pat and I watched a movie the other night. True story. Based on true story. When World War II ended, the Danish government held over all these young German prisoners, a lot of them teenage boys, and made them dig up these thousands and thousands of landmines on the beaches of Denmark that the Nazis had put in. And uh, so these kids are on their hands and knees probing the beaches for landmines. If they found one, they had to dig it up and defuse it, put it on a wagon, and once they were done, they got to the place, they'd make them lock arms and walk across the beach to make sure they did it right. Because if they didn't, they're going to lose some people. And, if, and, and a lot of them are getting blown up. And I forget how many thousand kids they did that with. 14,000 or something like that. Nazi. See, by the end of the war, Nazis had run out of soldiers that have no teenagers. Sometimes younger teens put on a uniform. And in that movie, it was called Lando Mine. It says only half of the kids survived that process. Went through the whole war and made it, or whatever portion of the war. But then they get killed after the war cleaning up landmines. Because there was such hatred for the Nazis at that time. What I'm saying is, you got to search your own mind for the landmines. What are thoughts I'm thinking of that don't align with the word? What are things I need to dig up and defuse? Amen. I'm kind of getting off track or on a sidetrack here. Why do I react while I react? I'm getting off sidetrack. I need to back up. Turn with me to Psalms. 139. Psalm 139. I want to go to verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. How many know God knows you? Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. You know what I'm doing. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God knows not just what you're doing, but what you're thinking. Amen. He knows everything. Thou compass my path and my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and hast laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. In other words, it's beyond our comprehension how much God knows about us. And it starts writing about the problems with the wicked not being judged and such. When are the righteous going to rise up? When's going to bless, going to bless the righteous? But go to verse number 23. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
and try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now this is a good lead in for what we're going to teach next. Is he says, you know my heart and you know my thoughts. Now what does that mean? I'll tell you what I believe it means. God knows what's going through your head. And he says, I know you're, he knows our hearts, but what are our motivations? I mentioned this last week, but our motivation for all that we do must be love. Because when you were born again, God put, made you a new creation in Christ. He put in you the very nature of love. You got the exact nature of love in you that Jesus did. Your spirit man is made in the image of God. So anything we do, say, or think about that does not align with love as the motivation is a result of contamination in our soul. Did you follow me? Let's say, for example, Kentucky's playing, well, they are playing tonight. Let's say maybe they're getting behind. And one of the other team's players goes down, he falls down. And if in your mind you meditate, well, I hope he sprains some of these out for the game. Here's a clue. That is not motivated by love. So young kid, you want them to hurt themselves? That's motivated by our own personal desire for our team to win. Can I take this a step further? And maybe you want your team to win because you identify with that team. And maybe that team's win, you feel good. If it doesn't, you feel bad. Maybe you call it your team so you feel like if they win, you win. If they lose, you lose. And perhaps the problem, the root problem is, is on our mind we identify more with the team than we do with Jesus. Was that too hard? I'm telling you because I've, I've seen this battle within me. What's funny, Robert? You repent, is that what it is? <laughs> We can identify more with a natural worldly team made of heathen players many times more than we do with Jesus. And when our identification is wrongly positioned in our mind, even though our heart would motivate us out of love because of contamination in our mind, we start to think the wrong direction, even hope the wrong direction. Even, even speak the wrong direction. Amen. You know, somebody's done you wrong. And I, I, I've had to talk to myself about this. I've had people do me wrong. I've had to come to this realization. I know I'm to forgive everybody, right? But sometimes my forgiving is, I forgive them. I won't consider it anymore. I'm not going to hold any hard feelings. God will get them. Now, see, the God will get them is probably representative of contamination in my mind that I was mistreated and I truly haven't forgiven. I've just set it aside. You follow what I'm getting. I know there's some deep stuff. But these are things I believe God wants us to get to the root of. And what we're going to get into is in the following weeks, look at. Not only is there a part of your soul that has the ability to analyze what you're thinking. It's able to go steps further and determine why are you thinking that? What is the motivation for that? Why are you considering that? Why, and is that love or not? And just like you've got to be able to cast down imaginations, you've got to be able to, to short circuit Wrong motivations. Cut them out. 
I mentioned this, alluded to it a minute ago, but also we've got to be able to analyze our reactions. How many beside my wife have ever reacted in the wrong way? Like she just did. Now, actually, I did it on purpose somewhat for a teaching moment. She knows I'm kidding. But it could have triggered something in her. Like, who does he think he is? I'll get him. I'll not talk to him for three days or whatever. It, it can trigger reactions. Just based on somebody saying something. Do you follow me? Whether accidentally or on purpose, it'll trigger things. And we've got to be able to sit down and say, why did I react like that? Am I not settled in my relationship with God and who he says I am? So we've got to get to the place nobody can offend us. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall by any means offend them. Psalm 119, verse 165. And we have a responsibility to step back and peel that on your back and analyze, why did I react like that? Even comprehend, is there things that happened in my past that produced that stronghold that produced a reaction? Amen. And make changes by the word. Confess new reactions, new attitudes, pure motivation. To get this mind totally worn. Not just thoughts, but reactions and motivations. Because of the reaction you have and the thoughts you have don't align with love, there's contamination. Again, I'm trying to think of a, a good example of that. I guess Patty's searching the pool. She's in the clear water. Everything's pure. Is she going to find any contaminant in that place and deal with it? So the thing, thing I want to get to is this is not something meant to be optional. Paul didn't say, you know, if you feel like it, take every thought captive. Think on these things. He said, do these things. And the scripture is full of instructions on guarding what we think, right? Putting in the word of God. Learning to, to uh, speak only that which is lines with God's will. Amen. You know, in James chapter 3, it talks about a fountain can't put out both bitter water and sweet. Well, He's talking about the tongue, but the Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's look at this for just a second. James is talking about your tongue can defile your whole body. But Jesus said what comes out of your tongue was first in your heart. And what gets into your heart was first in your head. Amen. Amen. We have this thing in our pool. We have several trees around. And frogs will get in it. And they'll die. They do die. They get in the pool and the chlorine kills them. And uh, sometimes they get out. And if you catch them right away, if you catch them right away, it's still somewhat of a green frog, tree frog usually. You take a little scoop net, scoop them out, throw them away. If he's in there for three or four days, he turns white. If he's in there for a whole lot of days, you can't pick him up in one piece. Pieces go everywhere. Isn't that true? And now the pool is contaminated. The earlier you get to the contamination, the less damage it does to the purity of the water. Chlorine or not. So you got to get, get what you want out of it early. 
But I heard this explained years ago, and I love it. You can't have both bitter water and sweet come out of the same fountain. And it used to amuse me how I'd go to a restaurant and they'd have a smoking section. But one air conditioning system. It's just sucking up one, going through the, dropping it down. Rupp Arena had a smoking section. It's the same air. Maybe you're more concentrated in that one spot. Do you follow me? But with the, with the pool, with the fountain, y'all bear with me. How many want to go to the pool where there's urinate, a urinating end? No die down on that end, right? I don't want to swim in the pool with a urinating end. And we have a responsibility to not the, let the devil relieve himself in our mind. Thank you, Jesus. How's that for putting it, putting it out there? Because he wants to. He wants to. In that movie we were watching, uh, after the war, there was such a hatred for German by some of these countries that were, you know, put in uh, really slavery, bondage. Germany conquered Dan Denmark and was uh, doing whatever they wanted. I mean, using the ladies, everything. And so after the war, they hated the Germans. And they reflected very well in the movie. There's one scene where these kids have been cleaning mines up in their setting, and some other German soldiers, German, I mean, Danish soldiers find them and start uh, using the bathroom on them. Everything. Out of hatred. Where do you think that hatred came from? The devil. And if it do that through people to other people, what do you think he wants to do in your thinking? I'm just trying to make this clear. And you have the responsibility personally to keep him from doing it. I know, again, I'm being repetitive, but I'm trying to make this clear. This was never meant to be optional. And I believe personally it's a mandatory step. Until you can dominate your mind, you're not dominating anything. In the natural, you're not carrying the glory of God. When it says the bride has made herself ready, it's not that she did enough good deeds. It says she took these steps to be able to carry the and house the anointings of God without the devil being able to turn it against them. Again, let me give you an example. In 2 Kings 2, I believe it is. Let's turn there. We have Elisha just gotten the double portion anointing. Just did his first miracle. I believe it's 2 Kings 2. No, not two, it's four. No, it's not four. Where's it at? Hang on, give me just a second. I'll find it this way. Let me do a search. It's Second Kings 2. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't see it. Y'all know where I'm going, huh? Let's see here. Verse 23. And he, Elisha, went up from thence. He's just done his first miracle. He's God's man with a double portion. Unto Bethel. Bethel, the name means the house of God. And as he was going up by the way, he's heading toward the house of God. There came forth little children out of the city and mocked him. And said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. Apparently, Elisha was sensitive about his hair loss. Amen. It was before they had a you know decent toupees, 
and no hair transplants. You had to carry a puppy on your head at that time. Good hat, right? Go up the bald head, go up the bald head. And he turned back. In other words, he stopped going toward the things of God and he turned back. He's been offended. And looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. He lost his temper. He used a double portion he had. This was not the will of God. He used a double portion anointing. And he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And 42 children were torn apart by bears. Not God's will. A man with the anointing did not have the landmines removed out of his mind yet. Wrong reactions. Look at the next verse. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel. And from thence he returned to Samaria. Now hang on a minute. Where was he heading before? The house of God. Bethel. Meaning house of God. And instead he turns to Mount Carmel. That's where uh, Elijah had the confrontation with the 850 prophets of Baal. And he goes to Samaria. Samaria is a representation of religion. It's a representation of uh, serving God your way. Rather than come to Jerusalem where they set up the city of Samaria where they made their own sacrifices to God and it became the home of the center of Israel versus Jerusalem was the center for Judah. Israel was always, I'm sorry, Israel, yeah, Israel and Samaria were always the home of the more wicked kings. Ahab was a Israelite king. Hezekiah was a Judean king. Do you follow me? And it looks to me like Elisha had a setback. Now, he continued his miracle ministry. But there's no doubt this was a setback for him. And 42 kids lost their life. And I'm telling you what God's going to bring on us is superior to the double portion that Elisha had. Can you comprehend that? The glory of God is God's highest anointing. It's manifested tangible love. And God's bringing it on his bride. And he can't have a bride that he puts all this power on. Power to raise the dead, move mountains, take cities, and have them temperamental. Have them with hair triggers. Have them they can't cast down offense or some little thought of the enemy. He's got to have a church that has guarded their mind, monitored their mind, filled it with the Word of God, rooted out wrong motivations, wrong reactions. So it can bring to them the highest anointings. And it won't be turned for darkness. It won't be used for prideful purposes. It will be used to edify Jesus Christ. Have you guys got anything out of this tonight? Can you see the direction I'm going with this? How many want to go? I've got to. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to seal it in our hearts and our minds, our understanding, and cause to be people that are all in. Take us and cause us, teach us to swim in that river. And give us hair triggers to explode upon wrong thinking. We refuse offense. We refuse oversensitivity. We refuse judgmentalism, unforgiveness. We refuse all the works of the flesh, jealousy, lust, envy. We choose instead to walk in 100% love. We thank you. We give you praise. In this church, there are none sick. We decree none sick, none in pain, none in lack, none oppressed, none in fear. Each member walking, moving into the divine calling. We thank you in Jesus' name, so be it. Amen.